I was born in London. This is actually the room that I lived in as a child. So my family still has the same home I grew up in. And I, I lived here for the first 11 years of my life in North London. And then my family immigrated to Northern California. But I come back fairly often and work brings me here. And so I get to return to my childhood home. Luckily, I don't sleep in the same bedroom. It would be a little too creepy, I think. Too. Yeah. It's me sleeping in but my childhood that, bedroom. How does London feel to you? Uh, if it is a place where you grew up, or you were born, but then... Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's changed a lot in mm. the 30, almost 35 years since I immigrated to America. Uh, my neighborhood is a little fancier than it used to be. Um, where I live in California is very rural. It's about an hour and a half north of San Francisco. My house is in the forest, no neighbors, completely connected to the, to the natural environment, uh, very quiet, uh, overlooking the bay and right by the sea. So it's very different than being in London, which actually I kind of like when I get to come back here because it's a very stark contrast and uh, vibrant uh, environment, um, more human centric, but a vibrant human centric environment and the sound of many languages on the tube and so much diversity of so many cultures and ideas always circulating, I find um, I find engaging. And, and London is a little bit different to, well, very different to a big American cities. It's somewhere between Europe and America, London. So you, you get that um, sensibility of a European city, but then again, there is a bit of brutality of maybe American cities. Not, not, not the kind of American brutality. Yeah. Um, I find London to be very distinct from any American city. Mm. Uh, to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of cities in general, especially American ones, but um, but I find London um, to be a city I, I feel more comfortable in, perhaps because it's home from mm. when I was a child. But uh, I've only ever lived in one American city in Boston where I went to university. So otherwise, my whole experience in America has been living in the country. Rural. But is that because your family moved to a rural place? They or did, yeah. 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 No, they, my family moved and I love loved it and wanted to move back there after university and raise a family there mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's it's a space that's not too far from you know towns and cities so you're you're not completely removed but it, in truth I'm, I'm very much a hermit when I'm home and I don't leave um, I don't leave the area very often um, well if um, well I, I was really fascinated with your um, I guess the all the things that you do and discovered you via the magazine actually. Mm. but then what was interesting is all the other things that you do that then I discovered subsequently which is the, the spiritual teachings as well as filmmaking and somehow to start we could just talk about how those three things or four or five how many there are I mean there might be some things that I haven't identified but how do they inform each other how are they one thing? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I've always kind of operated as if they all are one thing and just different um, ways of expressing the one thing. Um, but at the root is very foundational in my life is my spiritual practice and my spiritual life. Um, I was raised in a, in a Sufi uh, family and my father is a Sufi teacher and actually the house I grew up in uh, the, the downstairs flat was occupied by uh, my father's uh, teacher, who was a, a Russian woman named Irina Tweedy, who was the first woman to bring back this particular branch of Nakshbandiya Sufism that I practice to, to the West. And my father bought this house in 1980 and invited her to live um, here. And every day she taught downstairs. It was kind of like a, a modern day ashram of sorts where People would come every day to her flat from two till eight o'clock in the afternoon. And at the first few years, it was just maybe 20, 30 people. But she she wrote uh, uh, an account of her experience in India of training with a Sufi master. And it became a sort of spiritual bestseller in the early 80s and mm -hmm. attracted people far and wide. And what was interesting is, you know, back then there was no Internet and she didn't have a telephone and. Uh, my parents were kind of the intermediaries for people who were interested in coming to see her, but most people just showed up at the front door. They'd read the book and had gotten on a plane from, you know, 
from Paris or New York or Buenos Aires or whatever and wanted to see this 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 old Russian woman who captivated their heart. So I grew up surrounded in a spiritual atmosphere in, in, in a residential in street in London. So you grew up in a house where there would be people coming every day and knocking on the to door. meditate and to pray and to have spiritual discussion and receive teaching. So it, per it pervaded my upbringing. It was the it was the atmosphere in which I was raised, uh, and I very much also followed that trajectory in my own life uh, of of pursuing pursuing a, you know a, a mystical a mystical existence and. So the foundation of that experience, both as a child and then as I began to embody that in my own experience as I grew up, informed all of my artistic endeavors, all of my professional endeavors. Uh, I, my first artistic uh, career was as a jazz musician, mm -hmm. and uh, I fell in love with, uh, with, with the acoustic bass and jazz at an early age and ended up dropping out of high school so I could play prof professionally. And although although jazz is not what you would normally equate with, you know, a traditional Sufi practice, jazz is very much about being completely in the moment and mm -hmm. dedicating your life to a set of practices and discipline mm -hmm. that you then have to transcend to have a real sense of communication and engagement that is ultimately transcendent, mm -hmm. whether you're in relationship with your own imaginal creativity or you're in relationship with other artists who are also trying to challenge that. Mm -hmm. But the, the biggest block in getting in the way between any sort of real musical exchange is always one's own ego and attachment to your identity as a musician and what you could play and how good you were. So the parallels were always present. And the idea that um, what could be a better way to offer oneself and through creation of beauty. And I think that, um, you know, music is one form of, of the expression of beauty and it's alive and it's improvisational. And it's a reflection of so many things that are around you, history, past, present, and also the future as things are emerging. And so a lot of those themes are, of course, foundational to any real spiritual or mystical path, whether it's Sufism or Buddhism or competitive Christianity. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's grounded in any sort of desire to transcend the self and to communicate with the other. So whether it was music when I was young or older as I got involved in, in filmmaking, there it became a little bit more directly correlated because the stories I was interested in telling were spiritual stories, maybe not about personal development or mm -hmm. the stories of one's personal pursuit of truth, but more about the need for spiritual values to again be present in our society and what has happened to our society when we've become so disconnected mm -hmm. from the living world around us is a place of mutual kinship and reciprocity and respect um, that's rooted in a recognition of the sacred mm -hmm. uh, to all the ways that our society has become fragmented and economically and politically uh, dysfunctional as a result of become deeply disconnected from any sort of foundational values that value the other in all its forms. Uh, and so the stories I was interested in telling then became more directly correlated with my own spiritual path and practice. Mm -hmm. And um, and so everything I've done has really just been evolving from there. Mm -hmm. And I very much believe that um, spiritual life is really just life. It mm -hmm. shouldn't be relegated to something that you practice when you go to the meditation pillow or you're at the pulpit or whatever you might be doing. It has to be every day, all the time integrated. And so what you do, whether it is telling stories that might have a spiritual ethos or context, shouldn't be any difference if you were a school teacher or you know a businessman, that the way you conduct yourself should embody those spiritual values and try to reflect that. It doesn't have to be profound, it can be mundane, but life is a way to embody a spiritual way of being. And so what you do should be an, an embodiment or reflection of that. So in that sense, I was wondering, what is that element of Sufism or what is that thing that you can then take and use? You've explained that this idea of transcendence, but I think for someone who doesn't know what Sufism is or, or for yourself, that the sort of core element of it that allows you to then uh, produce or, or do these other things, what would that 
Um, well, I'll offer two responses. One is the more theoretical one, mm -hmm. which is that Sufism is very much based at its core on this concept of oneness of being, that everything is the divine. And there are different aspects of that. You might call that one aspect, the essential source that is unmanifest, right? That is like you could simplify it. And it's not, it's not like this, but I'll simplify it as if it's the transcendent God, you know, mm -hmm. unmanifest. And then there is the imminent God, which is manifest that you experience in all the multiplicity. And that's all of those way, from a human being to a flower, to society writ large are all manifestations of the divine. And they're connected to this fundamental source that lies behind it, but it's all one. Mm -hmm. So the oneness of being, if you not just believe that, but you are part of that consciously connecting to that, then that naturally becomes a gateway in which you respond from that place. So that's one central tenet of Sufism. And, and that is reflected in all the different schools, you know, from my school of Naqshbandiya Sufism to the Mevlevi school, which is very well known for the whirling dervishes that Rumi founded mm -hmm. in Konya in Turkey in the, in the 12th and 13th centuries. And, and then the other is that Sufism is a path of love. And, you know, why is Sufism famous? It's mostly because of love poetry written by Rumi or Hafiz or these great poets that emerge from, from the Middle East, um, you know, many hundreds of years ago. And their poetry was all about the expression of love for the divine and what happens when one is separated from God, this longing that pours out, that drives you to want to return back to the source. And so if Sufism is about love and your journey back to God is ultimately one through love, it's love that forces you to face the darkness within yourself and look at your own ego and your own false self and separated self and overcome that and drawing you ever nearer to returning back to the source and truth of, of the beloved because the Sufis refer to the divine as the beloved because it's their love. And if that is the other, um, say driving force, then again, what you do will also in some way try to be a reflection of that love and, and also of that longing. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are two sides one could say. Mm -hmm. so, so the separated self is an interesting term. Where do we encounter that? On this Zoom call, in the mirror, everywhere you go, it's, of course, a false sense of separated self because it is, you know, this whole notion of the ego is that you have a false self that you has been created as you've grown up and you've absorbed your familial conditioning and your cultural conditioning and you've created an identity and a separate sense of who you are that was different than when you were born, um, you know, and emerge into this world. and um sufis very much believe and again not just sufis many spiritual traditions or wisdom traditions that when you emerge into this world as a soul as a, as a young child you are completely connected to the source from whence you came and it is this journey that you go through of in sufism you call it of forgetfulness mm -hmm. that you forget that your divine nature is what it is and you then get taken over by this false sense of self the ego identity which makes it about you and, and your family and your culture and your education and then your ideas and beliefs reinforce that and then eventually at some point you begin to wake up and to realize oh maybe that isn't what it's all about and you look for meaning and truth that goes beyond the self and then one uh, begins to untangle that web of, of of a false self of an ego and return to something truer I mean that's the that's the uh, the spiritual path as it's been practiced for thousands of years. And so is it is it important to remember or is it because there's also there's also certain there's also certain value to forgetting. It depends on from which perspective you're looking at that from. Um, I mean the journey itself of going through this cycle of forgetfulness and then remembrance is a great learning vehicle mm -hmm. right and there's this belief um again not just in sufism but in many spiritual traditions that this kind of cycle of reincarnation occurs over and over again and that regardless of where you've reached in the previous existence uh in life that when you're reborn you will again go through this cycle of starting out in a space of connection and remembrance and then slipping back into forgetfulness until you again remember um, 
and you know maybe that happens when you're a teenager or you're in your 20s and suddenly you remember and you return back to where you were before that's the that's the understanding and you pick up the thread of your soul's journey which unfolds over many lifetimes uh and 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 there is value to having gone through that experience again to some degree but i would say you know from a spiritual point of view living a life which is purely a life of forgetfulness completely encased in the ego caught only in the uh, self-created human-centric existence and ego-based existence is uh, is a missed opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to to connect with something that is much deeper and more real. Whether you want to call it a journey back to God or you want to call it, um, you know, a deepening of relationship with things that are not purely created for the benefit of our own selves, and we're essentially a sounding, a surrounding ourselves with with a hall of mirrors that we look at everywhere we go on the individual level on the societal level. And, you know, where a lot of my work has focused on um, through filmmaking or through the magazine is that one of the, you know, look, they've always been uh, this, this journey of, of forgetfulness to remembrance and those who were drawn to return to truth, right? Whether it's the Buddha or it's Muhammad or it's, you know, the list goes on. Um, but for a long time, you know, for thousands and thousands of years in various shapes or form, culture more directly embodied an understanding that the world around it was sacred and had value beyond being a, a bed of resources to pull from to support our own benefit and growth as a, hu as a human being or as a culture writ large. And a lot of my work has been trying to say, we have to return to some sort of understanding that the world around us, the living world, is not purely dead and inanimate. It's an animate, alive reflection of the sacred, which needs to be respected. And this underpinned, of course, indigenous culture for millennia, and then influenced the development of civilizations for the last 10,000 years and was integrated in very different ways, mm -hmm. as many ways as there were cultures. But our modern cultures really the first culture which has completely denied the sacred in uh, in our lives outside of you know individual religious institutions and even then it's been mostly relegated uh, to the far corners of the room if at all but to have it again be part of how we think about how we are going to relate to the world around us that is what I've been trying to reveal uh, and many many storytellers and many people are focused on this because it it's the underlying issue I feel with you know the climate crisis, the environmental crisis we're dealing with is not a crisis of carbon. It's not a crisis of you know can we use green tech or not. It's a crisis of forgetfulness of the sacred nature of creation and that we've become separated from the living world and we view it as other. Mm -hmm. And anything we view as other and that we try to dominate, you know how the story goes. Mm -hmm. That's a story we know well on the human level and the a more than human level. Does one need a system, a belief system, in order to be awakened? No, I think that there are as many pathways back to God or truth as there are human beings. And there have over time developed schools that help take you there. And there are numerous ones. Um, and people are drawn to different kinds of schools of spiritual thought or religion um, or wisdom traditions or through art and music and various forms that take one towards a, a deeper truth. Um, so no, I don't think that we need an individual belief system or a prescribed belief system at all. I do think there needs to be a value system that is universal, that needs to be integrated into every fabric of our lives on a personal level and on a societal level. And I think without that, there's very little chance that we'll be able to function in a way which can bring us back into balance um, with the world around us. And we're in a state of complete imbalance. Uh, and, and the only way, again, I feel we can, we can find our way forward is returning to these fundamental universal ways of being, which is basically, you know, the golden rule applied, not just to human beings, but to the more than human world and respecting everything as sacred and alive. Mm -hmm. And if you have that as a foundational, uh, value you build upon, then there is something of substance that can allow things to flourish in all sorts of ways. But that to me is, is it a belief? Yes, I guess it's a belief in, in, the, in its basic sense, but it's not a religious belief. 
-hmm. It's not, you know, it's not even a spiritual belief. It's more primal and fundamental to that. And it's what existed there as uh, for us, it's there in our DNA as human beings, because it's how we existed for so long, which was that we understood that the environment was not just an environment. It was an extension of us, just like we were an extension of it. And we related to it on all sorts of levels with that awareness and honored it through our ceremonies and our rituals and our culture as it developed. But what do we honor now? Mm -hmm. I, I teach architecture and, uh, and the way I do that is actually we use the medium of film quite a lot. And we use it predominantly to observe the world and then work with, work with those almost phenomenological observations to try to really resequence an experience, which is really what a building is, but also what architecture could be in less maybe material or formal sense. So I value observation as a really important form of awareness, whether it's self-awareness, whether it's consciousness. And, and I was just wondering whether you can maybe reflect on that on the importance, and you yourself being a filmmaker, the importance of just looking in, in this, in what you've just described as a spiritual awakening. Yeah, I mean, I think observation is of tremendous support, importance. Uh, I would say that how one looks makes a difference to how one observes. And if you're just projecting yourself onto the space that you're observing, then you're only observing a reflection of yourself. So I would say that, you know, first one has to remove oneself as much as possible, and then one can truly observe. And then one, of course, becomes more present in the moment, more able to perceive the individuality and uniqueness of the people or the uh, manifestations of whatever it is you're observing, whether it's a building or whether it's, um, you know, a, a, a meadow filled with flowers or a busy uh, tube station. Um, if you're projecting what yourself onto it and you're caught up in your mind, then you're not really able to perceive it for what it is at that moment. Because, you know, I was just in a busy tube station yesterday, which for me, for the first few days when I'm back in London, is a stark contrast to where I live. And I always find it remarkable because it's just this live, breathing being. You know, as people go in and out of these corridors, going to their trains, coming from their various parts of lives. And, and going to work, going to going home, whatever they're doing, so many things coming together. And to try and be present in that moment and be in a state of observation, I mean, you're tapping into a tremendous, you know, multi-pronged being. Um, but if you're projecting yourself onto that space, then you're just focusing on the fact that you're going through a tube station and you might see all these people and all the posters and advertisements and hear things, but it's very different than being present in the moment and just being empty and then relating to what is present for what it is, not holding on to it, not trying to understand it, but just to be with it. And I feel like that form of observation is ultimately what you also try to get to, you know, it's very Zen, for instance, way of, of practicing meditation, you know, watching one's thoughts, observing it, um, observing them, excuse me, you know, allows you to create a sense of distance from those thoughts and step back and suddenly you're taken out of that locking space of prisonship that you've been. It sounds in. as if there is then a separation. You almost have to be able to separate yourself from yourself. Is that? A hundred percent. Yeah, you, you separate yourself from yourself and at that moment you actually start to perceive who you are as you are and you start to perceive the, the space around you as it is um, because you're no longer imprisoned in a, the same ego structure and just projecting your own self image on the world around you. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I feel like observation is key. And once you've, 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 I mean, a lot of spiritual practice is practices learning how to be an observer mm -hmm. and watchful of yourself and watchful of the space around you. Uh, not only so that you can live in the, in a space that is not dominated by your own self-image and your own ego, but so you can be attentive and present to the moments of life that flow around you and respond to them from that space of being real in the same way I was describing earlier in a space of improvisation as a musician. If you are, what are you doing when you're listening? You're constantly be observing. You're observing through your ears, all the things that are coming into existence through the other musicians' creations. And then you're finding a way to respond 
in a way that's real, but you have to do that from a place of observation and then engagement. So to me, there's those parallels there. It makes me think whether that point at which you're separated from yourself could, could actually be a permanent state. That's what the mystics would say you're striving for is a state of permanence outside of the limited sense of self and ego. And, and when you're in that space, then you're truly alive. Then you're truly living in, you know, the Sufis would say in, in the two worlds, you know, back to what I said, the oneness of being has these two different distinct parts, the kind of source, the unmanifest form of, of creation of the divine, and then all the manifest forms. And if you're able to step beyond yourself into a state of permanent existence outside of yourself, then you're tapped into these two aspects of existence. And then you're able to be present as something is unfolding inwardly before it's come into existence and as it is manifesting around you. So it's, that's very much kind of the mystical, um, you know, gold at the end of the rainbow, so to speak. Because presumably meditation is that moment where you're sort of, you calm down, you separate, and then you're able to then do that thing where you kind of look at yourself from. Yeah, it takes time. It's like, you know, let's say after many years of meditation, you might get to a space where you're consciously able to look at things in that way. At the, at the beginning, it's like you get glimpses, you, you're taken somewhere, you feel differently, but for it to become something you're actually able to consciously look at and observe. And is that your experience? Time. Are you able to do that? I've been meditating a very long time. You know, I've been meditating since I was six years old. Uh, so meditation is very central to my life. And so those experiences have, have, have become integrated. Um, I hate saying I can do this, I can do that. Uh, it's kind of antithetical. It's more whether you, whether that's the kind of flow of your day. You know, the, the mystic would say there should be no difference between what one experiences ultimately in the meditation experience. Mm -hmm. You know, and one's practice is how one flows through the day. It's a slightly different expression of it. One can go maybe deeper inwardly when one's eyes are closed and one isn't moving around your home or office or the streets or having a Zoom call. But ultimately, there should be very little difference. Mm -hmm. when I, as I was reading or in fact listening to one of the talks that you gave, there was a conversation about the state of being awakened. My immediate thought was the, the recent rereading of Friedrich Nietzsche's Zarathustra, where he talks a lot about the awakened one. And so before we started, I went to my bookshop and just grabbed the book and I thought, I'll just open it and then I'll see where I land and there'll, there'll be something that I underlined. So I did. And where I landed was a sentence where he says, a blesser I have become and a yay sayer. So I just for a moment want to reflect on the yay sayer. That's a profound question. Um, I would say that one way to respond to that as, you know, what is a yay sayer? Um, and it, for me is about acknowledging what something really truly is um, and to try to get to the root of what something truly is and see it for what it truly is and to honor it for what it truly is and to remember it for what it truly is when you've walked away from it to me that is what is being a yay sayer <laughs> because otherwise you you know if you are a naysayer <laughs> You were, you, were, you were denying something for what it is. You were denying yourself for what it is. You were denying you for who you are. You're denying anything that you encounter for what it truly is. Um, and you know, going back to what I was saying before about where we are right now at this time and what the, the underlying crisis is, we've become a culture of naysayers. And we deny things for what they are. We don't view the bumblebee for what it is. We don't view you know, the tree for what it is. We don't view consider other human beings for what they are you know where are they from how do they serve us you know that's the underlying question not how can i be of service and how can i help my fellow human being or how can i acknowledge you for who you are and then act accordingly so we've become a culture of naysayers so being being 
being someone who says yes is is acknowledging it for what it is, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how does the the medium come into play? The medium in which we do these things, perhaps say yes. And maybe I just want to shift this conversation towards film, editing of a magazine. Um, sure. Initially, maybe talk about how then this approach, which is to say yes, which is to acknowledge, transform into a actual medium for disseminating ideas, but also being in dialogue. I mean, I would say that the medium shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, you should be able to be in a space of acknowledging everything around you, regardless of what the medium is, whether the, the medium, medium is your profession. The medium is I think, you know? I think if you, if you, I think it's a limitation. If you only are able to do things within a certain medium, then you're limited. And yes, it's a lot easier to do certain things within certain mediums, but if one can only be creative through a certain expression of art, are you, what kind of artist are you? You're one which is limited. I mean, uh, and I think that again, if you're only able to acknowledge in a certain medium, if a certain conditions are there, then that's also a limitation. Yeah, I, it, it's much easier to be in a space of receptivity and openness when the right conditions surround you. Um, you know, maybe it's it's a lot easier to, to be in a space of acknowledgement um, if you're a gardener at Kew Gardens versus, you know, working at the London Stock Exchange, you know, the environment will inform your ability to be in a space of acknowledgement for what something really is. But again, I think it's a limitation if we have to def only be able to function that way within a certain medium. That being said, you know, of course, there are certain mediums, which I think, going back to what you were saying in relationship to film and, and running a magazine, which allow story to be present in a more relatable way. I, I also don't think that a story is defined to a medium. I feel like a story and the most powerful part of a story is how it integrates the person who's heard the story or read the story or watched the story or experienced the story and how that becomes part of their lives and interplays with the world around them. To me, that's the, the real story. The story, the book, the film, the the album, the the painting is a way to engage the human being, you know, mentally, intellectually, emotionally, physically, spiritually, you know, in the heart, and then it begins to unlock certain things, and a story begins to unfold. Um, but you know, the 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 time old ancient practice of storytelling is a very powerful vehicle in which to encourage people to move from a place of being a naysayer to being a yaysayer. Uh, and, you know, again, whether that is a traditional written story or in the case of what we do at Emergence, you know, uh, multimedia or VR or film or, you know, all the different uh, arenas that we work in, they're all trying to do the same thing, which is to tell a good story um, and a story that grips you and engages your heart and encourages you to go beyond yourself and engage with the world around you mm -hmm. from a deeper place of understanding and acknowledgement. And also to use it as a way to challenge the status quo and challenge the dominant narrative and the dominant paradigm and these kind of very entrenched systems which have taken over our world. You know, all the isms, capitalism, imperialism, racism, um, and on and on. And, but ultimately it's to try to create an experience. Mm -hmm. I think a good storyteller is only trying to create a real experience. Yes, it's trying to do all these other things as well, but if you're only trying to create an intellectual argument, are you only trying to create an emotional argument or you're only trying to, and the list goes on, you're limited. But if you're trying to create a real experience, then that's something that invites the uh, recipient of the story to become a participant of the story in a more meaningful way. And so the, the medium is powerful. The medium has always been powerful, uh, whether it's a, a sculpture or speaking around a fire uh, or a play. And now in more modern times when we have always access to digital media, 
um, those mediums. They, they offer us powerful ways to go beyond ourselves. And the focus of emergence really, again, is to try to bring the more than human world back into the space of conversation mm -hmm. and to recognize how we've been so dominant as human beings in shaping the narrative. We've banished the more than human world outside of our stories. They're mere secondary or tertiary characters that are su in supporting roles of the human, uh, the human character's role. And we're trying to say the important that, that we need to bring back the more than human, the, the anima alive living world back into the center of our lives. It should really be the center and we should be the supporting characters around it and to turn the tables, turn the tide. So how, how, how do you know that the story is worth being told? <laughs> How do you, what, what story? <laughs> I mean, What's there's the two different answers to that, right? I mean, there's, there's the storyteller in me, which is you're trying to discover the story for yourself, which is always in relationship with other people or the more than human world, you're discovering it and it's a bit of an alive process, but you're creating it as you go. And then how do you tell, you know, you follow your gut, you follow your instincts, you follow your heart, you follow all the different faculties you have at your uh, disposal. And, uh, and you and you try to find your your way forward. Try to navigate your 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 path forward so that you become with part of the story, and you you're not just telling the story. You're tuning into the story as an alive being and finding the best way to express it. Um, you know, again, so you're not just projecting your idea on of a story onto the space that you're telling the story. So as a documentary filmmaker, it's very easy to go into a space and have a predetermined idea exactly of what you want to do and then create that or aim to create that. And you have to learn to navigate like that in one hand with like, okay, there's a format or a structure or a, a narrative I need to tell, but how do I not remain closed to what possibilities are going to emerge from the discussions and conversations and experiences that unfold or the way that light moves it through a space, all of those things that are alive, you have to then bring those worlds together. So, you know, you're, you're constantly trying to discover it and, and, it's, and it's alive. As an editor, you're often relating to something which is a little bit more removed from that because you're not part of that creative process. So you're observing it more from the outside, but the same rules apply. You're trying to see and feel that there's something there that's real. And yes, it has to be well-written or well-photographed or well-shot or all those things that I feel need to be part of the way we tell a story. Craft is important, I feel. Um, it shouldn't be, you know, story trumps craft, but craft is important. Um, so you're looking for all of those things, but you're ultimately looking for something. Did this take me somewhere? Was this something that 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 engaged me on an intellectual level and on a heart level? Did it, did it take me somewhere? Did it offer me something? Did I feel? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking for those things as an editor and and a good story, you know, even if it's somewhat formulaic if it feels true and it feels alive there's something there mm. something with a medium of documentary is interesting because it almost the medium guides you towards something that is more free because you in a way you don't really know what someone is going to say but but, but there's something that um you said about um the story being gripping or or kind of you feel it if we just open netflix they have mechanisms to make you feel a certain way they know exactly if, you know how many minutes after the opening shot something has to happen in order to make you feel a certain way so there is an emergence of all these systems of knowing how we feel or how we are going to feel and i just wonder how do you then how do you then remove yourself from those kind of prescribed systems of narrative and storytelling and how do you then reach or achieve something that is truly maybe even new or or, or authentic maybe authentic is a good word i think authenticity can be present in a prescribed uh, formulaic structure mm -hmm. i mean before netflix was determining through algorithms how we're going to feel and what we need to feel at x minutes of the show i mean three act structures have been around a very long time <laughs> you know a hero's journey narrative which can be a trope and gets old has been around a very long time i mean there 
the oldest forms of storytelling are in some ways very similar to the, mo the, the majority of forms that we use today. I think you can be authentic within any prescribed formulaic, even boring form can have mm -hmm. authenticity and can have real feeling. I'm not talking about an emotional, you know, ride you're taken on because you've checked all the boxes that you need to have this happen at X minute in the film or, you know, this, this many pages into the book. I'm talking about, when I say feeling, I guess I should be more specific. I'm talking about engaging you in a way that taps into something that is real on this deeper level that I was speaking about early in our conversation. Um, and I think, again, you can do that in a very prescribed form. And, and in some ways, it's the, some of the most potent ways are within those prescribed forms, because it leverages the existence of those prescribed forms that have like a, an archetypal power in our collective and un unconscious. Um, so, but, but that being said, it can be done in a completely abstract form. It can be done in a, in a completely new form. And I think um, it should be. And at Emergence, we do both. We, we feature stories that are honestly very old fashioned in their storytelling and they follow three act structures. And I told those kind of stories myself. Mm -hmm. And we also approach things that are more uh, open and undefined and, and emergent and, and, you know, not falling into any of those prescribed categories. I think you need story told in all sorts of forms. And I, I've never been a person, and this is just me personally, who feels like, I just want to pursue one way of doing something, whether mm -hmm. it's as an artist or as a curator, um, you know, or an editor. I want to have lots of different voices and perspectives. Mm -hmm. You know, at Emergence, we have a, an ethos, that, an editorial ethos that defines our publication, and that's how we choose the stories we tell, it's what submissions we will accept. Um, but if you look at what we publish, it runs the gamut. It really is very, very diverse. But what is the defining thread? You know, it, the stories have to connect ecology, culture, and spirituality in some way. How you define that is very broad, and it should be, because we need so many different stories that are exploring these ideas and telling, you know, essentially the same story over and over again, that we need to return back to a space of respect and reciprocity and kinship and love of the living world. We were telling the same story over and over and over and over and over again as a publication, just as there have been lots of <laughs> places that have been telling the same stories over and over again. I mean, uh, so that you can have a different entry point. Maybe as an individual, you're more drawn to one kind of story that takes you in. And also the diversity of perspective is, the, is so important. Um, you know, just the way that someone tells a story about um, this, you know, this, this frame of, of reconnecting to our, to our not the living world around us, how one tells that from, uh, you know, uh, a vantage point of being from India versus the UK or from Northern California is very different. You know, mm -hmm. our, I, this is in the same way that a writer expresses themselves very different than a photographer, you mm -hmm. know, or, or, or a filmmaker. I mean, these, these are all the mediums of expression are important. The, the way we tell stories, who's telling the stories, this diverse pool, because also, what for me is the most exciting thing I would say about um, what we're trying to do at Emergence is not just the diversity of stories, the different kind of stories, and and following you know what is emerging at the same time, the trends that are starting to reveal themselves. Not trends, let's say the patterns are starting to reveal themselves, um, but the story that is told when you have present many stories present in one space. You know, the power of a library, the power of the salon. The power of the dynamic conversation when people come together on the dinner table is the same. It's like something becomes alive. Going back again to what I was saying, when the musicians enter the space and their individual contributions create an, a, a much greater contribution that transcends themselves. I feel the same thing is true in the context of a magazine, is that you have all these different stories that are present, and then that starts to reveal something else. Mm -hmm. So you need all of these ingredients. In fact, it gets so boring if it's just one or two or three or four, it should be many. And I guess as an editor, you're, you're, you almost have to see a conversation between these or like navigate or curate a conversation between these pieces because then that tells. Exactly, story. exactly, very much so. What, you know, how does it, how does it create, um, what kind of shape is, is, is emerging? 
and where is it going mm-hmm. and what are the ingredients that help it get there and what makes it too heavy on one side or too light on the other what does it need and that's the dance um whether you know whether we succeed or not is a good question we just try mm-hmm. you, you said that um at the emergence magazine you're, you're looking at three core things which is the ecology culture and spirituality i feel that uh, maybe we've uh, touched on ecology uh, with your relationship to the city and to where you live we've spoken about spirituality and of course we've spoken about culture but i wonder whether we could just try to define culture a little bit more sure i mean that's also yeah. you know, there's so many ways it was a big that's a big thing i mean i don't know if i'm going to define culture or but i would say that in the context of how we're thinking about it is that how does our relationship with the living world inform the way that we as human being, beings live our lives and how do we live our lives uh, you know on our own with our families in our homes in our cities in relationship to education to our government structures to our economic structures to our cultural institutions and art all the ways that all that we express and interact as human beings it's culture um for me the problem is is when culture is not connected to ecology and a respect for the living world and our culture is not respect to this to you know spirit and something other than the human i mean we're really good so good at creating culture which is all about us we have incredible meccas um devoted to this huge buildings all over london and new york and paris and san francisco devoted to human exceptionalism and culture that's all about us we just, we we were really good at building large halls of mirrors and that but there aren't about something greater that don't bring in you know the divine um and they don't bring in a recognition of the sacred as it unfolds all around us in the living world so if, again emergence is trying to weave these back in together because that's where i feel the problem lies is that if you if you don't have a balance then you know <laughs> the end is nigh mm. i think i i think it's interesting to think about those three things as one as you've just sort of <laughs> explained maybe if we just just once again just talk about the medium and all the different mediums that you have sort of navigated between and then this idea of transcendence that you were mentioning earlier and so i think there's something maybe interesting in terms of approaching or engaging with a new medium for the first time as being a form of transcendence you know because it it almost something that you need in order to explore something else so i was wondering if you could if you could explain that trajectory but not in terms of the medium that you need it in order to transcend but maybe what that link was and and i almost w- w- would love to ask you where where do you think you can transcend next i mean to me it's a very simple answer which is that again whatever the medium and the situation the only way that i found the ability to transcend is to step aside and so i'm just constantly trying to step aside and whatever the medium is while also holding a space that i need to hold in that environment you know in 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 an inner space of in meditation i just have to hold an awareness and an intention uh, and and but hold, as an editor it's very different you're holding you know professional standards and you know what kind of quality of work you want to accept or consider or so on and so forth there's there's a different context but you're always trying to step aside you're always trying to step aside and get out of the way because i truly feel that for anything real to be expressed or to, to emerge or to be recognized you have to step aside and i truly believe the great artists understood that instinctively and and knew how to step aside so that they could tap into something much greater than themselves whether that's within the imaginal creative realm the archetypal realm you know spiritual planes of existence the ability to perceive something that was around them and and translate that but they had to step aside 
They couldn't just be projecting their own self and trying to interpret it. Step aside and become a vehicle and a conduit. That's to me at the heart of the heart can of it. Point, can you point us at, at at moments in the history of the world or art or philosophy where uh, that person was able to step aside? Mozart, Leonardo da Vinci, um, <laughs> John Coltrane. I mean, the, the names can go on and on and on. I feel like they've always been there. The, you know, there's always been artists and thinkers and writers and poets who can step aside and tune into something and express, express something that allows us to experience something beyond ourselves. I mean, that's the greatest power of what those transcendent moments that bring us into a different relationship hold is that they aren't just bound to that poet or that musician or that artist. They, they are alive as like a, a, a stream of energy that, that you can tune into. So you're looking at that painting and you can enter that realm and you hear that poem a thousand years later, you know, or you read that text in a different part of the world in a different time. And yet you're taken somewhere and it touches you on a deep level, hits your soul. So I, I too, you know, there are so many, there are too many, too many times. Maybe the, the interesting thing about Da Vinci is that, and maybe something to, to, to explore a bit further, is that he didn't paint so many paintings. The time was the thing that's considered the work. So I just wonder, what, what's your view of productivity? Uh, I mean, I, I, think it, I think that's... I don't think productivity... Um, equates to quality. I don't think that productivity makes something more valuable because you've done more of something. I think some artists are prolific and prolific in all sorts of modes of expression. And Da Vinci was one, Shakespeare, you know, Rumi, you know, so many people incredibly prolific and then there are artists who've done less and died young. And they've offered so much in just a few words. Mm. I think it's what, is present in those words or those notes or those brush strokes or whatever the the form is that that holds power similarly to what we were saying earlier about you as an editor being able to facilitate conversation across pieces across different people that might not be in a direct conversation it actually made me think of a conversation i had with a, a new york galleries recently you know we were talking about uh, relationships of private galleries and institutions and then when i asked her how do you approach that she said well you need to be needy and giving at the same time and i thought that was such a wonderful way of putting it mainly because when my students ask me you know, how do I form good relationships and, you know, good professional relationships, good, you know, intellectual relationships as I now go into the world, uh, I always tell them, well, you need to be giving and you just have to keep being giving, you know. So I think in your practice, there is so much giving, but I, I also want to maybe underline that notion of neediness and just maybe explore that for a moment. I would replace neediness with hunger. Mm -hmm. um, I think mm -hmm. the artist is always hungry. Mm -hmm. The mystic is always hungry. The storyteller is always hungry. Human beings are hungry. We're hungry for meaning. We're hungry for relationship. We're hungry for connection. We're hungry for nourishment. Um, and so, yes, we need to be giving, but we need to be hungry. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the, the two work together. You know, from the mystical point of view, your hunger to return back to your beloved is what ultimately gives you access to something that you can then give back. And you need you need the longing on one hand, and you need the union on the other. You know, the one leads to the other. Ultimately, to become giving, one has to be hungry. Um, you know, and from an editorial standpoint, you know. We're hungry for good stories, hungry for fresh perspectives, hungry for old perspectives told in a new way, hungry for beauty, hungry for things that challenge the imagination and the cultural imagination. 
hungry for for so much and so that we can work to give that in a way that nourishes but also evokes hunger in other people so they you know because if you've tasted good food 